G'day fans and we're back talking about Star Trek Discovery. How exciting is this? It's Dags and MPS with you today and we're talking about the show Terra Firma. Well, it's the episode actually because it's part one of two parts. You've got to have two parts to make a two-part episode. Doesn't that make sense? MPS, quite quickly, what did you think of Terra Firma? Obviously, part one. <laughs> well, I thought there was some... Uh... Very uh, intriguing parts to it. And for the most part, I sat glued to when we uh, got to the mirror universe. But we'll talk about more, more about that later. Yes. Upon reflection, we decided to go back to the mirror universe. I was trying to think of a really good joke there and it just didn't come out. All right. So the first thing we did, we start off with some really funky FX, CG FX, reminded me of the movie Hollow Man, actually, with all sorts of like transparent bits and pieces of good old Giorgio there. And out of absolutely, I thought the funny thing is, so the David Cronenberg character now has a name, uh, Kovic. He appears out of absolute nowhere. He's walking around with everybody else. No one's even questioned, who are you? Why are you wearing a suit from the 20th century? Doesn't really matter. And he just seems to know everything. And I found the problem was that almost as the episode started, it was like exposition city. It was like, oh my God, all this backstory, all this stuff's going on. I had to rewatch a couple of times because it's just my poor little nerdy brain just couldn't absorb it all. What do you think of all that? Well, look, I thought it was a bit much. We didn't need the entire CG element of Giorgio coming up again. I just thought that was a bit sort of too much. You t- you're talking about it, but you don't need to see it, in, and it's a hologram. Uh, those big, thick rim glasses, I tell you what, it's they're sort of a bit off-putting. Um, it, sort of, it sort of makes you wonder what else he's hiding, you know, and now all of a sudden he knows everything. He knows all, sees all, hears all, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then he tells about... Um, Lieutenant Commander Yor, not mine, Yor, uh, who, <laughs> who in, uh, what was it, 2379, cross time and dimension. He was a yeah. time soldier. So now we've got a whole new uh, possible series we could open up for Star Trek called Time Soldiers, and that would tell you about all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, but all the temporal accords and all that sort of stuff got a little much, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because like with uh, like Trek nerds who love this stuff, you know, because they saw the the dude wearing his first season Next Generation uniform and they got, oh, my God, it's like a hark back to the next generation. And of course, if you know your next generation well enough, you could argue it's like, well, hang on. Um, what about the Traveller from the Next Generation series? I mean, you know, who, who dealt with uh, Wesley and all the rest of it. I mean, how does he fit in the scheme of things? Because he was traveling through time and space and all sort of business. So it's. I reckon some people out there will be sitting there analysing it going, uh, yeah, it kind of works, but kind of doesn't. But, you know, it is what it is, and we'll just work on with what we've got. And, of course, the key thing is a good old Kovic just spills out of absolute nowhere because, you know, he, as you said, he is the know-all dude, that Giorgio, because she's travelled a 1,000 years in the future and is from the Mirror Universe, she's having some problems. She's, like, losing her structural integrity, effectively, and turning into a feral cat, going to go completely psycho at a moment's notice. And... Um, you know, a lot, that, a lot of people just were discussing that. Thinking, oh, hang on, I mean, time travel's been going on for hundreds of thousand years in the Star Trek show. Why is this one suddenly a big deal? Uh, and, of course, dare I say, in Star Trek 2009, the crew of the Narada, you know, they were stuck in the Kelvin timeline for 25 years, and they were okay. So the assumption is that if you travel, like, a really, really long distance in the future or the past, it's going to cause you problems. But So the idea is if you're from the Mirror Universe, you go in the future, uh, you're going to end up with a headache. <laughs> yeah. I think it was... It- The way I saw it and that was explained was that the two universes are not just going parallel, Mm. they're actually going away from each other, which means that, yeah, the further away you go from something, it's like a a signal when you're driving in your car and you go away from the town, you know, you start losing the signal. So that was probably a better way to do it. Uh, but I don't know if it actually will make sense later on when they no, try and come exactly back to right. It. it was almost like the mirror universe version of a butterfly effect, you know. So, uh, but you would think that yeah, they would go in their sort of separate paths because just the nature of how these things work. But you know, after a thousand years, it could be completely different uh, areas. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that was interesting. So we got a whole this stuff dumped on us in the start with, and there's also the sub story of like you know, good old Saru's Kelvin crew stuck somewhere, but they just got completely ignored for the rest of the episode. It's almost like hey, we'll cover those in yeah. part two probably and everything went off into the mirror universe and of course we ended up uh on the planet on the ice world and now some people have actually picked up on there i thought this was quite cool actually so you got michael and the mirror universe giorgio on an ice planet 
we're at the very start of Discovery, the whole show back in season one. It was actually Michael with the prime version of Georgia on a desert planet. I thought that was an interesting way of mirroring itself. I don't know if you if people picked up on that, but uh, if you have fans, then uh, good for you. Uh, and then, of course, we end up uh, meeting that dude, the guy from uh, CSI Las Vegas, <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. How'd you make all that? Well, I thought that was that was interesting because the way they shot that, um, I thought was great because you never saw any other footprints in the snow. You mm. just saw those two. So they must have used a lot of drones and all that sort of stuff. So yep. I thought that was pretty good filmmaking. Then all of a sudden you, you look down, which made no sense whatsoever. It should have just been a pan across to, to see some dude just sort of set up. Um, but yeah, and then they called him Carl. So yeah. from The Walking Dead. Yeah. And I thought, hang on a second, how many things are we crossing over here? Yeah. You know, so I thought that was, was intriguing. Um, his dad jokes about the door and that, how it was adorable and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that was some of those that was pretty funny. Loved it. Yeah. Um, but you couldn't have had another character do that. He was he had the look to sort of pull that off and to make it sort of funny. It was like the old um uh entertainers of the eighteen hundreds, you know, like the circus folk who would sort of um the traveling circus folk. It sort of reminded me of that. But the door was interesting because it looked like a door from either side. And when he opened it, I thought you might see something in there, but at the same time you didn't. So it wasn't until she actually walked through and it'll be curious to see how long in part two or even part three, depending on how long we go for this story, how, how long she stays in there and how long they've waited for it. You know, if it's one of those instantaneous things where she's been gone for weeks, days, months or whatever. And, and, you know, they've been standing outside the door for like five minutes waiting for her. So yeah. that'll be interesting to see if she comes back at all. Yeah, some people are thinking this is her way out of the show or at least out of the season, which is probably not surprising. Um, so a, a lot of fans have been mulling over the fact as to whether this dude is meant to represent the Guardian of Forever from uh, Sit in the Edge of Forever. And the reason why they've drawn these parallels is the newspaper that he's reading is called The Star Dispatch. And that's exactly the same newspaper that shows the Edith Keeler stuff from City on the Edge of Forever. So fans have just gone completely nuts over that. It could have been just the prop department going, hey, this would be a nice little gag. Let's just chuck it in uh, and let fans interpret it the way they will. Or it could be intentional. Uh, and there's also other references to the 21st Street Mission, which, of course, appeared uh, in City of the Edge of the Forever and uh, some other bits and pieces. So, um, But a lot of people, and I, I actually thought of this too, this whole thing with the door and going through the door, it was a very typical star trek sort of thing uh it's almost like entering the, the twilight zone if you will and it had a real star trek classic feel to it uh based on as opposed to what we've seen already this season so uh it kind of worked actually i thought it was actually kind of cool um but once you got into the mirror universe um it's divided fan opinion big time some fans have said yay because yeah mirror universe was always popular and a lot of other fans have said nah, not interested like it's great fun and it's cute but it doesn't progress the story at all even though in this case it's progressing Giorgio's story uh and i think that um it's it's sort of divided everybody but you know th there are some positives to it like the character of uh ellen landry re uh, reappeared they did make a big song and dance about it because i think she got killed off uh, at one point in the show last season and then she's suddenly back and the, all the rest of the crew get to wear funky new uniforms and costumes and get some makeup and have big big ass fight scenes and all the rest of it so they, they must have had a whale of a time putting this thing together uh regardless of whether or not it was actually necessary or not so uh, uh how'd you make all that I thought it was interesting that they went back to a certain point yep. because if, if we recall, that was sort of where they were um, when Michael sort of betrays her back in, in the previous series. Yep. It means that we don't have to see anything new and we can sort of, it's almost Groundhog Day, but yep. that's good in a sense because you've gone back in time to a point where really, like she says at the end of it, we can actually now create our own future. So you've got a choice of what you can do, which means that, you know, if she decides to stay in the mirror universe, that'll be good. Uh, but if we had to start as somewhere completely different, no one would have had any idea what was going on, you know, and it would have been yeah. either, did she come back to see herself get killed or anything like that? I think the positioning of where they put her was actually quite good. Yeah, there's two things that have sort of come out of this. One is a lot of people wondering, oh, hang on, are we going to see Lorca? Because uh, in the Mirror Universe, the prime Lorca is meant to be somewhere because the Mirror Universe was in, your Lorca was in season one. So people were wondering whether he's going to pop up and hopefully he will. That's Jason Isaac. So they're, they're like busting their chops, hoping he'll appear. But the key thing, I guess, if there's going to be any story development or character development is the fact that Giorgio now has a bit of a soft side. 
So she's already got a bit of a conscience about everything that's going on and seeing uh, Saru and the Kelpians getting mistreated and she's like standing up for, up for them, whereas once upon a time she wouldn't have bothered. And clearly that's what they're trying to show here in the storyline, that yeah, her time on Discovery where she's always been the aggro, you know, don't mess with me, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll kick your head in time sort of scenario. She's now starting to get a bit softer and a little bit more, um, she's changing effectively and becoming a different person. And of course, she's human. trying to be the hard-ass emperor. Well, at the same time, she's now got a bit of, uh, bit of empathy for uh, other characters so uh, and other races. So what do you think of that? She's almost becoming human, if you will, yeah. you know, to the sense that, um, uh, yeah, she's, she's looking. I think she's, because of the time that she spent on Discovery, she's looking at, at things completely different, um, which is interesting. I, I thought Tilly, as her second in command, was, was pretty good. Oh, Killy, um, yeah. Killy, yeah. Uh, she sort of, there's something about her now where she's noticed something, and you can tell she's noticed something, but she's going to follow her regardless. She's not going to take over. Um, and then Michael's character, well, she's, you know, she's plotting everything anyway, so we'll see how, how she comes out of it. But what would have been her death is now going to be something else. So, It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I um, there was a couple of things that I I, I liked the really. I think it was the coronation scene. The, the way that was all done was it looked beautiful. It was really well filmed. Um, I thought it was surprising that like Stamets is holding the knife in his right hand, which means every the whole audience can see it. And it's like, uh, isn't anybody going to say, "Hey, um, um, Empress, he's holding the knife"? <laughs> it's like, well, you didn't notice. It's like it's not like he had to conceal up his sleeve and it just pops out and slices. So. Yeah, I kind of didn't get that. Or maybe everybody wants her dead, but uh, who knows. Um, but that was actually a really, really well-played-out sequence. Um, yeah, I, I did like all the, the costume and the way mm. it looked. I love the the theatrical nature of the people yeah. rolling down on the on the silk ropes and that sort of thing. That was magnificently done. It yeah. was almost it was almost watching a play within a play, if you will. You know, mm. you had the, the, the actors on the stage. Which is really interesting because you think to yourself, "Well, hang on, why would you do a theatre play in a in an evil empire?" Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's uncharacteristic, sort of, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, certainly different. But see, we did see a bit more character development because going back to to um, Giorgio leaving Discovery, yep. Saru and her had that little chat. Yep. saying that, you know, we've never minced words and, and, and that. Mind you, I found it interesting that he turned around and said, well, we can actually fob her off because if she's going to die, just let her die and we'll go fight the, the, the Emerald Chain. And, and the Admiral goes, no, you can go and do that mission and we'll do this. It was all a complete reverse around from every other episode in the last few weeks. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. That was very clever. There were some really, really clever moments. And I think you're right. The last moment between Giorgio and Saru was a nice leading to when she eventually sees him or his his mirror universe counterpart a little bit later. Yeah. Had they not had that last discussion and that last shake hands and all the rest of it, that may have played out differently. But that was a nice way of linking those two um, um, sort of moments, which was very cool. And that whole sequence you're talking about was actually really, really good. The fact that Tilly yeah. hugs uh, Georgia, mm. which she's least expecting us. So she's getting this physical contact with people in a, in a very positive way. And yeah, all that was deliberately designed to set her up. So that when she went through the door and back in the mirror universe, it's like, oh, okay, uh, I've got to readjust my thinking, but I'm struggling to do that because where I've just come from. So I totally agree with you too, which was kind of yeah. cool. What I thought was interesting was the fact that she accepted the hug from Tilly. Yep. You know, yep. she, she basically went, it was mm. like, oh, yeah, okay, this kind of feels all right. And well, especially frankly, after the I, start. Sorry, especially after the start, when she spilled all the food over her in the in the mess yeah. room, when she was cracking the shit. So, uh, yeah, exactly right. Very good stuff. I like. Yeah. There was a couple of phrases that came up that I kind of find it, it's like amazing, like the dilithium nursery. It's like it's just like like, like all these baby cribs full of like little dilithium yeah. crystals. That's how I interpreted that. And I was like, how can you have a dilithium nursery? That's just so. I want to use a different word for that. Uh, and I also made very subtly a reference to the prefix code. Uh, and a prefix code, of course, is from Star Trek, the Wrath of Khan, where you use the, each ship has a prefix code to stop other people um, hacking into their systems. Uh, and so if you know the prefix code, you can actually control the systems of another ship. And I was actually, I thought that was actually quite cool. And they just slipped that in. So uh, I thought that was a nice little hark back to at least Wrath of Khan. So after a thousand something years, even though Discovery's all been upgraded and whatever else, they've all still got prefix codes. So how good is that? Some things never go away. Very good stuff. 
Um, any final thoughts on Terra Firma Part 1 before we give it a rating, Mr. MPS? I think there was uh, there was a couple of things that didn't make sense. There was one part where uh, they were with the Admiral and it sort of a, it dawned on me that after a little while why this is the case. We talked about it before how they could just beam out to wherever they want. They just double tap and they beam out to wherever they want. It sort of occurred to me that maybe Discovery haven't figured that out, that you can just do it all the time. And they walk because they're naturally, yeah. that's their instinct. So, because you see the Admiral, he just beams straight out and the rest of them all walk out into the turbo lift and, and go from there. Well, it's certainly possible that if you're not used to the technology, you'd almost be a bit apprehensive about it. I mean, Linus is about the only one who's used it on a regular basis and even he had problems working at where he was going. So maybe it is a case of, it's the old Dr. McCoy thing, you know, where you're actually afraid to use it. So even though you've got it, you go, ah, oh, yeah, I'm not 100% certain. So maybe you're right, there's a bit of apprehension on, on their part, which is uh, which would make a lot of sense because it is pretty new and pretty radical, so uh, yeah. very much so. So what is your rating, Mr. MPS, for Terra Firma Part 1? Very exciting stuff in some Federation logos. What do you got for us? Well, I thought it was, it was they had some cool moments, like the, all the robots were black on the Mirror Universe side of things, and I thought that was a nice sort of touch, even though they were completely useless. <laughs> um, and, you know, the nursery just made me think of, like you said, baby dilithium crystals, you know, just being, you know, cradled and all that sort of stuff. All the crystal um, going, wee, wee, wee. oh, we're burning, we're burning. Anyway, move on. Yep. <laughs> um, look, I thought it was a pretty average episode after all that. Uh, there was some, there was nothing spectacular about the episode. It was, it was just average. So I'm going to give it three and a half. Very good stuff. Um, for myself, I thought the Mirror Universe stuff was cute. It looked good. It gave the crew something different to do. It was very pretty. Uh, but aside from the whole it's giving Giorgio something to do uh, and exploring her character a little bit, effectively it was, it was almost like it didn't really progress the overall story. The overall story is the burn and uh, emerald chain and all that sort of stuff so it was actually a bit of a deviation a bit of a like a like oh let's go back to let's go back here just because we can have a bit of fun with it not because we really need to uh so for that reason um uh i'm not necessarily a mirror universe fan so i found it interesting to watch but it, other overall it was like yeah okay i could have just you know gone without it so uh i agree with you 3.5 for me uh so it, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that Giorgio's character is getting a little bit of development, it probably would have rated less. But, uh, yeah, I reckon I'd go with 3.5 as well, which is, um, I think, a pretty fair assessment for a lot of uh, people. Because, as I said, some fans are just not going for it at all and they've just ranked it right down. It's like, nah, move on! So um, there you go, which is what we have to do because next week, Terra Firma Part 2, how much you want to bet they'll just wrap up the whole Mirror Universe thing, go straight back to the main timeline and then figure out what the hell's going on with these Kelpians and their ship uh, and get this whole season uh, wrapped up very, very soon after a few more episodes, which is very, very cool. So based on that, we're going to go too. So make sure you keep on trekking on. Okay, we'll see you then. Bye for now.